This evening is a, is a very special program. For those of you who have come to this meeting, uh, John Samuels and Joe Patrick are no strangers. When last season they did a terrific uh, program concerning the Harwoods box that John had remastered. This evening, the two of them would like to do a tribute to one of the greatest pianists of the 20th century, George Bolet, who would have been 100 on November 14th? 15th. 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 Okay. And because that marked the uh, centenary of this great pianist, John and Joe are going to do a two hour tribute to him, and, and they will discuss the trajectory of his career and his recorded legacy. Numerous rare live recordings, including videos, will showcase his extraordinary artistry. One of the last examples of a true romantic pianist, Bolet at his best was both unique and profound. The great Russian pianist Emil Galels once referred to him as, quote, the greatest pianist in the Western Hemisphere, unquote. Bolet came to the United States at a young age to study at the Curtis Institute of Music. He came by his romantic temperament quite honestly. He studied with such piano luminaries as Leopold Godovsky, Joseph Hoffman, Marx Rosenthal, and David Saperton, and later with Abram Chasens. In his 20s, he became Rudolf Serkin's assistant, and many years later, he was the head of the piano department at Curtis. He won the coveted first prize of the 1937 Naumburg competition, and reviews of his concerts were consistently positive. Yet, Bolette's career was slow in building, and he didn't achieve universal acclaim until the 1970s. Renowned for his playing of the music of Franz Liszt, Bolette actually had a wide and varied repertoire playing such diverse composers as Bach, Mozart, Beethoven, Schubert, Weber, Chopin, Schumann, Mendelssohn, Godowski, Debussy, Rachmaninoff, Rager, and many others. Are we going to hear all of them tonight, gentlemen? Close. Close, okay. Uh, he even conducted the Japanese premiere of Gilbert and Sullivan's The Mikado. Now on to our guests. I'll try to make this as short as possible, if not shorter. Joseph Patridge, the gentleman all the way at the end, has been a member of Ross for over 25 years, a recording producer and owner of Patrick Sound Studios in New York City. He has produced and or engineered over 350 CDs for various labels and thousands of private clients. Educated at the Aaron Copeland School of Music, he has performed as a pianist, conductor, and choral singer. From 1980 to 1993, he was classical music director at WFUVFM, and also the co-producer and co-host of Concert Grand, the radio program devoted to the piano that aired from 1977 to 1993. Uh, one thing I must mention about that program is, in that period, there was not one repeat program. Am I correct, Joe? Mm-hmm. So you and, you and Bruce Posner, Bruce, you're in here somewhere. There you are. Hi there. Um, you know, my hat's off to you. 16 consecutive years of producing a program once a week with not having to go back into the archives and throwing a tape up for the 12th time. And sometimes it wasn't even fun. That's right. You mean when you had me on as a, as a uh, on a round table one time? Oh, that was death. We remember that. Um, he has been involved in the design and construction of studios for Harvard University, the University of Missouri, Kansas City, the Edison National Historic Site, and the International Piano Archives in Maryland. I think I was along for the ride on all of those too, right? Uh, as well as many private studios, and as a member of the Association of Recorded Sound Collections Technical Committee. John Samuels, the gentleman sitting to, nearer to me, is a native New Yorker, has been a member of ARS since 1978, a reissue producer and engineer of classical jazz and Broadway recordings for over 25 years. His work on many labels has been acclaimed by both press and public, and earned Grammy and Gramophone Awards. He was associated for 13 years with BMG RCA, where he did significant work on the complete recordings of Julian Breen, Yasha Heifetz, and Arturo Toscanini. For BMG, he produced major retrospectives of William Capel, Pierre Monteux, Leontine Price, and Leopold Stokowski. He was the co-engineer on three major New York Philharmonic CD collections released by the orchestra itself. I think we worked on that together a little bit, didn't we? For Sony Classical, he's produced and engineered comprehensive sets devoted to Yasha Heifetz, Vladimir Horowitz, and Arthur Rubinstein. He has compiled numerous discoveries, including Leo Black, Piero Coppola, Emmanuel Foreman, the Fonzale Quartet, Leopold Kodowski, and Vladimir Horowitz. Ladies and gentlemen, I introduce John Samuels and Joe Patridge, who will talk about the artistry of the legendary George Bolette. Gentlemen. Thanks, Seth. So George Bolette, whose 100th birthday passed uh, five days ago, a pianist who probably was not uh, 
appreciated as much as he was during his lifetime, at least not until the end. And even afterwards, 25 years later, uh, people still are discovering him. Even we are discovering him. We certainly are. Um, Joe and I have been working on a dual project. We've been trying to put together a radio program which just aired last night. And we also have been trying to do this program and trying to do two distinct programs, one geared towards the radio, one geared towards a live audience. So what that meant was going through Bolette's recordings, and there are a lot of them. There aren't that many commercial recordings. There are about 40, 50 discs, all told. But in terms of live concerts, especially from the late 70s to the early 80s, there's a huge amount of material. And we spent a lot of time going through it and trying to choose things that were interesting, revelatory, different, uh, things that perhaps people would not have heard. Um, you know, there are some Bogolette collectors, and some of them have some of this material. But a lot of it hasn't surfaced at all. And so that's what we're going to be doing today. Yeah, pretty much everything we are airing, airing. <laughs> See, there I am in radio. Morning. I was going to say. Uh, everything we're going to present tonight are live performances of one sort or another. And uh, many of them are actually from bootleg uh, performances. And we'll say no more about that at this point. I wouldn't have said it at all. Well, I think it's worth mentioning that a lot of the bullet live performances out there are bootleg performances. And I think that's important because he wasn't being recorded that much professionally. But he certainly was being preserved by collectors. Bolette was not recorded in the studio between 1960 and 1968. And until 1981, he wasn't recorded on a regular basis. And so most of the live material that exists that's Bolette in top form is from the 1970s. But what we're going to open with is actually something from a bit later. Uh, this is a special instance where we have a television program that was put together by the gentleman who's going to introduce this. Um, this is, uh, well, I guess we'll go right to it. We'll hear from Frank Bell. Or not. I could be identified simply as Frank Bell, producer of the radio and television series, The Virtuoso Pianist, personal friend of George Bolette. In the early 1970s, the Atlanta Music Club booked Michael Ponte to play in the Civic Center. I had begun hosting my radio program called The Virtuoso Pianist while I was still in college at Emory University. An official with the Atlanta Music Club asked me if I could get Michael Ponte on TV in order to promote the upcoming recital. I asked the TV people about the project, and they said yes. Then they told me that I would be the producer of the program. I had no idea of what a TV producer did. But with the inexperienced courage of a 20-year-old, I attacked the project, and within a couple of days, the one-hour recital by Michael Ponte played on Atlanta TV and the music club had a full house. When I was 15, I started meeting my favorite pianist, and they were kind enough to establish friendships with me. So once I produced the Ponte program, I decided to produce TV recitals with all of my favorite pianists. Eventually, my programs were broadcast around the world. Like most truly gifted performers, George was at his absolute best when he was before an audience. The audience's appreciation for the music and for his skills gave George tremendous inspiration. In the studio, much attention is given to correct playing, and that can be quite frustrating to an artist. There is no one-way or definitive performance of a composition. Before a live audience, it is the moment that matters. The communication between the artist and his public can be magical, and the greatest performers, such as George Bolette, feed on that magic. Among George's strengths was his gorgeous tone. No matter how loudly he played, he maintained a lovely sound, and this takes real skill. George's love of a beautiful sound and his desire to communicate the music's essence were the qualities that were most important to him. George picked instruments that would allow him to realize his desired sound. 
That is why he preferred to play the Baldwin and Beckstein pianos, because their tones were so rich. All of the work that he did was devoted to bringing the music to life. And for the listeners who think it's strange of me to make such a comment, I must say that there are many performers who seek money and praise far more than they seek to serve the music. George's mechanism was superhuman. When he was in top form, his fingers were supernatural. Even at tremendous speed and volume, George's fingers were accurate. George's expression was superb, in my opinion. We all have different tastes. For me, the beauty and expression of a composition is most important. Some other people regard form as the most important thing. I call them aural mathematicians, not music lovers. But for my super romantic taste, George was among the supreme interpreters of music. George's greatest weakness sprang from one of his greatest strengths, ironically. George had a fantastic memory and almost infallible fingers. Thus, he almost never practiced. I would spend days with George, and he never touched the piano unless he had to rehearse with the orchestra. Even when I wanted to get levels for the microphones for the times that I recorded him, George didn't want to play passages for me. Thus, I must admit, even as George's friend, that he was lazy when it came to practicing. That is why he cut the cadenza of Prokofiev's second concerto, and why he rarely played few fillet. He was just too lazy. So now we will see George Bolette in the program directed and recorded by Frank Bell uh, from 1987 in Atlanta. And I've got to stall a little bit because Joe's not quite ready. Um, we will soon see George Bolette playing the fugue from the uh, Prelude, Chorale, and Fugue of César Franck from 1987.
I found watching his fingers from above fascinating. I don't know if you had the same reaction, the really long fingers over the keyboard. They also look like they barely moved. Yeah. But obviously they did. You, you know, what's interesting is that pianists will notice that his fingerings are really odd, but they work for him. It wouldn't work for a lot no, of other wouldn't. pianists, but he has very interesting way thumb goes on the black keys a lot, and, and yet it still all flows very nicely. I have to say one thing. Um, just as an aside about the Baldwin, I know that uh, Frank Bell spoke eloquently and uh, in favor of the Baldwin. I never had that particular uh, liking of the instrument myself, but I have to say that Bolet got sonically more out of a Baldwin than any other pianist I ever heard play a Baldwin. Well, it's interesting that um, initially Bolet's reason for going with the Baldwin was loyalty. They supported him when he didn't have much of a career. Uh, later, he decided he actually preferred the sound. He had played Steinways, and in Europe, he tended to play Bechsteins, at least earlier in his career. Later, he tended to play the Baldwin. And Frank makes a reference to the Bechstein. But the Baldwin had a quality. I'm not a huge fan of the piano in general. I mean, the Baldwin of that period. But I agree with Joe. I think what he managed to get out of the instrument is, is actually quite something. Um, now, we opened with a video because we felt that that was a dramatic way to start, but after this we're going to go primarily chronologically. And the next cut we're going to hear is from the earliest surviving concert um, that Bolette gave. It's from 1936 in Philadelphia. Now, tapes of this have been floating around in not very good sound, but this piece is a first time. Um, people have not heard this before. Joe, do you want to introduce it? Sure. Um, this, this was a radio broadcast from December 9, 1936. It is the earliest surviving bullet item in existence. He was 22 years old and a student at Curtis at the time. And what we decided to excerpt from the, I believe there's eight pieces in the broadcast, is the first of the uh, two concert etudes uh, which, uh, which are, there's, there's a group of three concert etudes and a group of two concert etudes. Uh, this is the group of two, the first of the two being Waldeslauschen. So this is Bolette from December 9th, 36.
This was the period when Arthur Rubinstein came to Curtis to hear what Curtis was producing and heard Bolet for the first time and was extremely impressed, and you can hear why. I mean, this is remarkable for a 22-year-old, the, the maturity, uh, not even just the technical gifts, which are obvious, but uh, it's really quite a performance. And uh, you can only imagine what, uh, what it must have been like to be sitting there in 1936 and listening to this 22-year-old pianist and wondering what's going to happen. Unfortunately, what happened was not quite what one would have expected, at least not initially. We will get to that a little bit later. A few years later, um, somewhere, and I don't, we don't really know much about this performance as far as venue or actual date, but somewhere... Um, Most likely New York or Washington, D.C. Right, in 1944. Um, those were the days when a lot of pianists uh, made transcriptions of things, some, sometimes great music, sometimes not so great music. Um, the, uh, the opera Schwander the Bagpiper by Jaromir Weinberger might probably not make the great music pantheon, but Abram Chasens, the pianist, composer, raconteur, and director of QXR for many years, decided to excerpt part of it and create a fantasy based on Schwanda, and Bolette, who knew Chasen's and I believe took some lessons with him uh, at Curtis, decided to play this piece in 1944, and this is what we have.
you know, it's interesting. Joe mentioned that Bolette studied with Chasens. He actually studied with Chasens after Curtis. He studied with him as a mature artist when his career wasn't going anywhere in the 1950s. And Chasens was the man who actually got him the gig of playing for the soundtrack of Song Without End, which was a biopic of Franz Liszt with Dirk Bogard. But you wonder if there's a connection between that and his study, and between this recording and his studying with Chasens, because he didn't know Chasens at Curtis in the in the no, 20s no. and 30s. He did, he did. Not in the 20s and 30s he didn't. He knew yes, him later. He did because Chasen was, was uh, Hoffman's assistant. But he didn't know him. He didn't study with him directly. He only, no, he studied he, with... He knew him at the school there, of course he did. But he didn't know him as a pupil, is my point. Anyway, the point is that Bolette's, Bolette's relationship with Chasen's developed after that. These recordings we know next to nothing about. They were put out on the Lyra Pan America label which was meant for export to South America, but beyond that, we don't know. We think it was recorded, as Joe said, sometime 1944, 1945, probably from a live performance. Again, not known. Um, but it's an interesting piece, which he didn't play again, as far as I can tell. There's no evidence that he ever played this piece after that. And it's not a piece that I think is played very much by anybody else either. No, Jason's wrote it for Constance. I mean, he... For himself? No, he wrote it for Constance. Oh, you wrote for Constance. You wrote it for Constance. And she used to okay, play a lot. but she didn't play it much, did she? She played it a lot. Did she really? Oh, yes, she did. Because I never heard it. her play it, and I heard her num numerous times. She recorded it. I, so that I know. That I know. It was recorded well, a few you times. Hear her when she was on the circuit. The only pianist, days. the only pianist I ever heard play it in concert was Shirley Cherkasky. Yeah. And uh, also studied with Chase. Also studied. That's right. <laughs> Maybe that's something to do with it. Anyway, the thing about that paraphrase, of course, the specter of Godovsky looms large over it, I would say. Not that it was on that level, but it's an interesting item from a, a person who I think was a better composer than he's given credit for, Chasen's. I think a lot of his original music is quite good, but he, um, he isn't known as a composer very much these days. Anyway, moving on to somebody who's much better known as a composer, <laughs> as well as a pianist in his day, is Gershwin. Now you wonder, why would George Bolette be playing Gershwin? He actually played Gershwin quite a bit, and there is a Bell Telephone Hour of uh, Bolette playing with, with Whiteman doing the Rhapsody in Blue. <coughs> this is a little bit later than that. That recording that I mentioned was from the early 60s. This is from 1967 where at a summer concert as part of the series that the Philadelphia Orchestra played at the Saratoga Center, uh, they did an all-American program, an all-Gershwin program actually, and two pieces were played by Bolette, by Bolette, Rhapsody in Blue and Concerto in F. Now, for time reasons, we're not gonna play the whole second movement. We're gonna play it from where Bolette enters uh, the, pro uh, the program but you'll get a very good gist of, of his inflections and how clearly he was able to play American music. This is, by the way, August 13, 1967, Saratoga Springs, Philadelphia Orchestra, Ormandy. Thank you. 
you know, this isn't the combination to inspire confidence when you think about it. Bolette and Ormandy doing Gershwin. And yet it's great. I mean, it's absolutely great. Ormandy's right with him. He's got the idiom down perfectly. You wouldn't expect a Cuban and a Hungarian to get it, but they do. Ormandy led a dance band when he was young. Yes, he did. Yes, he did. Was this a, a broadcast? This is from broadcast, yeah. Because it's very depressed, which is not your fault. I apologize, but so yeah. It's it's pretty it's it's pretty good sound, but it's from actually it's it's not from broadcast. It's from a rebroadcast, okay. so the original probably sounds better. Um, but in any event, uh, for the next two cuts, they are they are related, and so we're going to play them consecutively. But I haven't given Joe much of a chance to talk, so he's going to introduce them. Fine. Anyway, there are two encores from an incredible concert that Bolette gave in a festival in Holland called Arnhem. I mean, well, that was the name of the town, actually. But it was a festival that was started by the musicologist Frank Cooper. And he brought Bolette over, and he played this amazing concert that we can talk about more later. But two of the encores were the Sanson Zgodowski Swan from Carnival of the Animals and the Polish Leutzer Concert Etude, Opus 1, Number 2. Nobody knows much about Polish Leutzer. They even don't know much about him in terms of scholarship. Don't even know if he wrote them. Wrote well, we the also pieces. don't know if he wrote them. Some people think Muskowski wrote these, actually, and they sound suspiciously like some of the Opus 72 etudes. Um, well, he has two etudes that he's known for. And this that's all the music we know of. Too, and that's all the music we know of. We also don't even know what year he was born. Some sources say 1841, some sources say 1842. The general consensus is that he died in 1898. That's about all we know about Paul de Schleutzer. In any event, so these are two of the encores from the concert, um, starting with the Sanson Skadowski, and then we'll hear the de Schleutzer. What year is it, Joe? 1974. Five, May 23rd, 1974, Arnhem, <coughs> Holland.
I only have one question. How does somebody who doesn't practice play like that? Because that really... <laughs> Frank Cooper mentioned that when he was spending time with Bolette during the Arnhem Festival, he said he never touched the piano outside of rehearsals for the, you know, to try out the instrument before the concert and the concert. How do you do that? <laughs> this is a mystery to me, but anyway, those are uh, two of the encores from the 52374 Arnhem Concerts, Sansan Kodowski's Swan, and Polish Schleuser's Agent of Swan Number 2 in A-flat. Now on to another performance from the same festival. We're actually very fortunate to have both of these things. Frank Cooper supplied them directly, and he'd lost them for 20 years. Uh, apparently, he has a lot of things in his house, and so finding things isn't all that easy, and he just found them a few months ago. So it's... Sure. Is that better? Is that better? Okay. Anyway, um, Joe actually picked this, I think, if I recall. Uh, this is a recording of a piece that Bolette actually did in the studio, uh, the Scambati Piano Concerto. And Joe said, we just have to use it. It's just so magnificent, and I agree. Uh, we're only going to have time for the third movement. But this is from the same Arnhem Festival three days later.
I want to briefly give a little background on this festival and its progenitor. Frank Cooper was a professor at Butler University, and he came up with the idea of doing a neglected romantic music festival in which pieces would be played that hadn't been played in a long time but used to be popular, the Scambati being an example. And the leaders of Arnhem in Holland heard about it, and it's a rather unimportant city, and they decided they wanted to make a splash for the Holland Festival. So they came and basically copied the idea. And they invited Frank Cooper, they invited George Bellet and others um, to give concerts there. And Frank decided to program Bollett's concerts by focusing on the things he thought he did really well and convinced him after the Scambati Concerto to play the Townhäuser Overture as an encore. Now, if you know anything about the Townhäuser Overture, it's not an easy piece to play. It's quite exhausting. And you, so you can imagine the effect it had at that time. And I wish we had time to play that performance. But we do have the three cuts that we just played from two different concerts, and they, and, and they are amazing. And this is really, in my mind, and I think Joe's as well, Bolette's best period, which is the mid-'70s. From here, we go to another encore piece. Uh, Bolette was famous for playing Schubert List songs, and these are songs by Schubert that List basically took the vocal writing and added it to the already existing piano. And we both thought that this was a rather beautiful recording. Um, it is the Schubert List Auf dem Wasser zu singen from 19, I can't even read it, where did I write? 1975 in Bloomington, Indiana. There's a home.
you know, Vallette's career, um, his recordings in the studio were of very varying quality. John and I, I think both agree that one of the best records he ever made was his first Deco recording, which was Schubert Les Songs. However, even that album pales in comparison to the way he played uh, live. And this is a perfect example of it. The, the recording is beautiful, but it's not like this. No, it's not. And the next thing we're going to play is an example of the same thing. Uh, we're going to hear two sections from Schumann's Carnival. The, um, and he did record this for Decca. It was a successful recording, but Bolette had a reputation among many people of being somewhat withdrawn, somewhat uninvolved, and playing very slowly. That was not an illegitimate observation, but it's an incomplete one. Bolette did play like that sometimes, and a lot of records are like that. But the live performances, if you pick and choose among the best ones, which is what we've tried to do here, are remarkable. I mean, the, the beauty of tone that everyone talks about is there, but the fire is there too, as you could hear in the previous selection. So we're going to hear two movements from Carnival, Opus 9, from 1977. To me, that Chopin section is just gorgeous. I was curious. I went back to the Decca recording because I was curious how different it was. And it's the same interpretation, but it's not the same performance. The, the outlook is the same. The tempo is pretty similar, a little bit slower. But the beauty, the, the sheer loveliness of the way he caresses that movement 
isn't there, and it is here. And, and I thought it was very important to share that with you. So for our final number, Mr. Patrick is going to carry it from here. I guess so. Although I want to say something relating to the carnival as well, which is having heard many people play bad carnivals. And, uh, and I don't know this performance. John picked this. And of course, I'm very curious to now hear the entire piece. What I will say is that having heard many people who have no idea how to play a piece like Chopin, this would be very instructive for them to hear this performance. It might actually give them some insight into what Schumann actually intended when he wrote a piece called Chopin in his carnival. Anyway, George Bolette, of course, was known as a big pianist, as a Liszt pianist. And we went back and forth quite a bit on what to play to close this talk. And uh, we thought about the Tannheiser that John mentioned as the encore from Arnhem, uh, from the Scambati Concerto Concert. We talked about any one of several of his Norma fantasies, because he took on Norma uh, late in life. Um, in the late 80s. He actually had learned it as a young man, but then brought it back and played it a couple of times in 87 and 88, more than a couple. And it's very beautiful playing, but it's not quite, it doesn't quite capture everything that Bolette had to offer. So of course we end up having to go back to the mid 70s, the highlight of Bolette's career in both of our opinions. And uh, so we hit upon the Don Juan fantasy, of course, because where else are you going to go when it comes to George Bolet and Liszt paraphrases? Liszt wrote um, 93 paraphrases according to Wikipedia. One could certainly argue that Don Juan is the best of all of them. One could argue about some of the others. In my opinion, Don Juan is the pinnacle of Liszt transcription, and that makes it the pinnacle of transcription, period. Um, for those of you who don't know, it's based on three scenes from Mozart's opera. Uh, the uh, overture... Uh, to the, Don Giovanni, you should identify the opera. Uh, I think everybody knows what opera we're talking about. Oh, okay. Here. But yes, it is Don Giovanni, Mozart. Um, the first part uh, he takes from the overture, the second part from La Cidra La Mano, which I guess is another way of saying, I want to hold your hand. And then the uh, last part is the uh, Champagne Aria of Finch Handaldino, which has nothing to do with a drunken songbird. Um, the I, I did that for you. Um, anyway, we went back and forth on performances too, because there were two in particular that struck us. One was November 9, 1975, in Avery Fisher Hall. That was the closing work on the printed program. The other was August 5th, 1976 at the University of Maryland. That was also the closing work on the printed program. And uh, we went back and forth. We were even talking about this at 5.30 this afternoon, trying to figure out which one to play. Well, November 9th, 1975, one. Uh, Part of, the, part of the problem, you did say to interject if I had something to say. Part ahead. of the problem is this is one piece he always played well. He didn't, he was an inconsistent pianist, and if he wasn't in the mood, he didn't always give the most enthralling concerts. But Don Juan was clearly a piece that, that uh, sparked his imagination, and he always played it at the, end of a, at the end of a concert, just before the encores, and he always played it well. But these two really were, I would say, the best that we heard. Yeah, and the November 9, 1975, has a little bit of a personal resonance for me since it happened to be the first piano recital I ever attended was that concert. And so having heard George Valletta as the first pianist I ever heard playing Don Juan, I knew it was all downhill from there. And uh, 39 years later and probably about 5,000 concerts later, I still remember that concert very vividly. Whereas some other concerts that I heard two or three days ago are nothing but a faded memory. In any event, um, so, one thing I want to mention is that Bolet made a few changes uh, of his own in, uh, in the text, uh, things that he thought might be slightly improved. I figure for those of you who may not know the piece well, 
I'll just hold up my finger every time one of those passes by. He also interjected that long ossia uh, before the champagne aria, uh, which is not done very much, even these days, in the days of everybody playing every scrap of everything in every piece. Uh, people still leave that out. But Ballet liked that uh, ossia and included all his performances that uh, we have. So, to close our evening, let's hear from November 9, 1975. Liszt's Reminiscences of Don Giovanni by Mozart, George Ballet, Avery Fisher Hall.
I swear I could hear Don Giovanni singing. Well, that was uh, a long time ago, but it still resonates very deeply in the memory, the entire concert. I know at least one other person who was here who was at that concert. I don't know if anybody else was. Dan, were you there? No. I wasn't in New York. You were in New York. Okay. Was that his first public performance? Hmm? Was that his first public performance? The Don Juan? Yeah. It's the first one I had. Mm. I don't. I actually don't know. We might be able to find out, but I don't know. One thing George Bolette said was that he hoped to be remembered in 50 years for being one of the last great romantic pianists. Leah, it's up to you. You're going to outlive everybody else in this room. So you've now heard her. So you have to pass it on. Anyway, thank you all very much for this evening. We enjoyed uh, being with you and hope you enjoyed listening to George Bolette and a little bit to us. Okay. Any questions from anybody before we close out our meeting? Where was the Carnival um, played? Well, embarrassingly, we don't we don't know. We know the date, but we haven't yet found the location. Um, but it's clear from the sound that it's it's got to be a professional recording. Um, you know, the last the Don Juan was a bootleg. Uh, it was recorded from the audience, and you can tell. I mean, it's, it's not bad sounding, but it's somewhat distant and a little distorted. Uh, the Carnival sounds like a commercial record. So whoever made it, and I honestly don't know who made it, uh, I'm, I'm grateful, but I don't know where. As a matter of fact, I, I talked today to probably one of the leading ballet experts in the world to try to find out the date of the January 31st, 77, I mean the, uh, the venue, rather, of that concert, nobody seems to know. Huh. It's a real pity. Any thought it was in New York? It's doubtful because yes. you would think someone would remember. Um, Google uh, using the New York Times search. Yeah, I haven't found it. Um, now, by the way, before anybody runs out, we do have bolet CDs for sale. So if anybody wants to buy any, we will have some after we finish here. Thank you. Okay. Well, Joe and John, I want to thank you. It brings back some memories for me. I saw him. Substituting for Claudio Rao at Hunter College in 1971, after Rao canceled twice. Uh, we, may have been at, we may have been at the same concert, because that was the first time I heard him. That's 1971. right. 1971. Yeah. I thought it was 72, but yeah. Oh, 72, that's right. Hunter yeah. College had a series. It was a Be Beethoven uh, third concerto was what I heard. What did you hear? No, no, this was a solo recital. Oh, okay. You're, no. thinking, you're thinking of... Uh, no, this wasn't at Hunter. This was Alice Tully. What no, I no, saw. this is Hunter College. Okay, but the same sort of experience. Yeah, essentially, uh, was it a Rao was supposed to play, he got there, he canceled. They rescheduled. We come in for the concert, we sit down, there's a piece of paper inside. Mr. George Bolet is, is going to substitute. And he opened with the, uh, the Franck Prelude Chorale and Fugue. Mm -hmm. So did we. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And the we last, did that just for you, sir. And I was at his last recital. You were there, Joe. That was the one where he opened with the Schubert I think we were, Sonata. We were all there. <laughs> The Schubert Sonata. All, the, all of us that were Bolet yeah. fans, were, uh, you were at that concert, Schubert, right? The Schubert in Adria. Yeah, yeah. where it started off. Yeah, like last concert in Carnegie, yeah. April 16th, right. 89. Right. Why? Well, I, I remember, what I remember, I'm sitting there, and it's kind of going along, going along, and he hits the third move, and all of a sudden, it locked. He couldn't do anything wrong for the rest of the, for the evening musically. And a pretty good town hoiser overture. Not like 74, but. But it was no, pretty but, good, yeah. But he was, he it, was very ill. He was very sick. Yeah. Yeah. He played, he played I was remarkably well. I was well. amazed right. how he actually was able to get, get through, through that right. absurdly right. difficult piece, right. being a sick man of 74 years old at the time. Right. Well, did right. anyone know he was sick? It was well known. At yeah, that point. well, he, I, I, he was pretty. He, he knew at that point. He knew. He knew. I think it was. I, th I think but, the public. But public's I think people. Look, I knew, so somebody told me. Yeah. He didn't tell me. He was also. His clothes didn't fit. Uh, he was looking rather haggard and, and ghostly. You could sort of tell, even if you didn't know, that something wasn't right. Uh, and, he, and in Berlin, he canceled the concert during the concert. He walked down on stage and couldn't play and walked off. Uh, there was some question as to whether he was even going to play that recital in, at Carnegie. So it was, if it wasn't widely known, it was certainly known among various people. It was still a terrific concert. Yeah, it took a while for him to warm up, but when he when he hit his stride, he did that night. 
Oh, Dan, yeah, I Dan how many times? I'm sorry, Seth. Yeah, I was ahead. just wondering, how many times did you hear him? Not that many times. Mm -hmm. You know, he never came to Boston. I don't know why. But the six years I was in Boston, he didn't play. Hmm. So I didn't yeah, hear him. Is that before. right? And that was hit or miss. I heard some lousy recitals. I heard, I heard one at the Met Museum. It was pretty bad. He was a very inconsistent. Was, like the Browns of Mike Sonata, terrible. I knew somebody was great a, second a half variation. though. The Rachmaninoff Chopin variation was great better, on that better. concert. There was, a, there was another concert. A friend of mine was that he did the Handel variation, the Browns Handel variations. By the end of the piece, everybody was asleep. Yeah. And I heard a rock too. Carnegie Hall, not good at all. That I didn't hear. No, that I missed. So. With with the. Uh, um, the guy who's conducted in Jersey. McCall? McCall? Yeah, it was Dr. McCall. Yeah. It was, it was really an off night. And an off night, he was pretty tall. Especially in the 80s, he had a lot of off nights. Uh, in the 70s, not so much. And that's why we focus tonight's program mostly on the 70s. But, you know, you read the reviews from the 30s and 40s, and they're not good at all. And he's playing reviews. They're, they're erratic. Taubman, Taubman reviewed him very positively. Uh, but, yeah, they they basically, he said he changed because of Chasen's. He said that Chasen's made the biggest difference in his career. He was playing like Browns 116 and, and all this cerebral stuff that really wasn't. Well, actually, we had, a, Browns we, had a, yeah. we had a Brahms schedule for tonight, which we had to not play, which is gorgeous. Um, Brahms 117. 117? Yeah. Well, anyway, thank you, Dan. <laughs> and thank you, John and Joe, once again for another terrific program. I mean, in the sense of the, the, the level of music playing tonight was just. Just, you know, one cannot express words about a man who unfortunately was so underrated during his career and never really came into his own until the end. Uh, just to let you all know, our next program will be on Thursday, December 18th. Matt Barton from the Library of Congress will present a program devoted to Western Swing Band recordings, talking swinging from one uh, musical part of the musical uh, pendulum to the other. Well, anyway, happy Thanksgiving to all. Hopefully, we'll see you in December. Thank you again, John and Joe. Thank you, sir.